Hello folks, Professor Watts here. We're continuing our look into some applied topics in economics, and today we're going to look at another one of my favorite areas, which is finance and investing. I want to start off by providing some positive motivation for investing, especially if you happen to be a young student, and that is that almost anyone can become wealthy. All it takes is time mostly because as we'll see money grows over time and if you have enough time you can grow a small sum of money into a, as large a sum of money as you want. The idea of small changes given enough time generating big results was portrayed by the character Andy Dufresne in the movie The Shawshank Redemption. Oh Andy loved geology. I imagine it appealed to his meticulous nature. An ice age here, million years of mountain building there, Geology is the study of pressure and time. That's all it takes, really. Pressure and time. Dufresne talked about time and pressure creating geologic change over time. And in a related note, we're going to talk about, in finance, time and interest creating potentially tremendous investment growth, creating wealth over time. Now, you have to have some income to work with. You can't save if you don't have any surplus. But as we'll see, if you start early enough and have a long enough time period, you don't have to save a, a crazy large amount of money. You just have to save consistently over that time period. Okay, so I wanna start off by talking about some basics of interest. What is interest and what does it represent? So interest results from a fundamental economic axiom known as time preference. Time preference, simply stated, means that people prefer to have something sooner rather than later. And to illustrate time preference, I think it's very useful to take a look at what is known as the famous marshmallow experiment in psychology dating back to the early 1960s. Let's take a look at the short video clip that describes the marshmallow experiment and the underlying psychology of time preference. Our economics correspondent Paul Salman has the story, part of his ongoing reporting, making sense of financial news. This is among the most famous experiments in the history of psychology with implications for economics. In which a group of four-year-olds were given one marshmallow and told that if they could wait to eat the marshmallow after being left alone with it for a while, then they would be given an extra marshmallow to eat. Most eat the marshmallow as soon as they are left alone with it, but some other children are able to resist temptation. About one in every three is able to hold off. And YouTube is replete with videos of kids struggling to not eat the marshmallow. So what's the big deal about self-control? The big deal about self-control is if you have it, you're able to actually pay attention to the teacher and to learn. Psychologist Walter Michel devised the marshmallow test 50 years ago, running it on hundreds of preschoolers at Stanford University. Twelve years later, he found significant differences between those who had wolfed down the marshmallow. They were now found to be more easily frustrated, indecisive, disorganized, and those who, as tots, had been able to control themselves. They were now more confident, self-reliant, and get this, scored about 200 points higher on the SAT. The powerful economic message is that if you do exhibit self-control at an early age, says Michelle, you've got a much better chance of taking the future into account and likely to have better economic outcomes. So the paying and receiving of interest then emerges from this phenomenon of time preference. And you can think about interest, it's very simple in this manner. It's the reward for delaying you, the use of your money, which is saving. On the flip side, it's the penalty you have to pay for hastening or for advancing the use of someone else's money, which is borrowing. In that marshmallow experiment, kids basically earned some interest in the form of an additional marshmallow if they were willing to wait. They were willing to delay the benefits of using their resources, quote. And so we can describe interest rates also then as a price that matches savers to borrowers. We have a supply of money that savers have extra of, and we have a demand for from borrowers who need the money now. And with any supply and demand market phenomenon, we need a price that matches supply and demand. It's an equilibrium phenomena. To earn interest, of course, you need to be a saver rather than a borrower. Now, most of us, as we go through life, we're going to go, th we're going to engage in both saving and borrowing. You'll borrow more when you're younger because you haven't had time to earn money or save money. 
But as you become older, usually your income goes up, your capacity to save goes up, and you can pay off the debts you incurred when you were younger. If you become a net saver, meaning you're saving more than you're borrowing earlier, you'll have more time to enjoy earning interest and build wealth. Okay, so why does time matter so much? Well, this is the crux of what I want to talk about today, the logic of compounding returns. You can think about growth progressing in two manners. One would be linear growth, where we have a constant rate of change. We add a fixed amount to our stockpile every year. That's not how money works. Money and interest works geometrically. It's also known as exponential growth. You have a rate of change that increases over time. So with money, you add maybe 10% this year, but next year, because you've got the 10% that you added in the previous year, you add 10% to the initial amount plus 10% to the extra 10%, and then 10% to the 10% you gained in the second year, and so on and so on. So what happens is you get with interest and geometric growth, a growth quantum in your investment fund that gets larger and larger and larger as you progress through time. You can think about that when you look at the plot of an arithmetic growth curve or a linear growth curve, which is just a straight line, and a geometric growth curve, which starts to bend up as you go forward in time. Compound interest, you can think of that as growth on growth, and over time it's growth on growth on growth on growth. Okay, so the next thing I want to uh, give us a, a brief overview of is a concept known as the time value of money. And this is just a way of thinking about how money changes over time given interest rates. So we've noted that due to interest, money can grow over time. Notice I, here I say can, it doesn't automatically grow. It has to be invested. It has to be channeled to a person or entity that will pay interest or a business investment that will generate a rate of return. This is what happens. Money now grows into a larger amount of money later smaller amount of money today will grow into a larger amount of money later. Let me give you an example. At 10% annual compound interest, $386 today will grow to $1,000 in just 10 years, roughly a tripling of your initial investment. Here's the math we use for thinking about this compound growth over time. It's known as future value. And what we do is we take the starting amount of money, here I'm calling that M, an amount of money, M, times 1 plus R, where R is the interest rate, so that's your initial sum of money. This is the interest rate you're earning on an annualized basis to the N time periods. This is the number of periods. You could think about it on a monthly or annual basis, and the calculations I'll be doing later will do this on an annual basis. And notice that we are multiplying our amount of money by our interest growth factor raised to the power of N. Okay, that is an exponent, and that makes this an exponential function, and that means we're going to see exponential growth. So future value is taking us forward in time, but we can also think about the time value of money going back in time, or projecting from that future amount. So for example, my same $1,000 in, in 10 years invested at 10% compounded annual interest. Now I'm gonna think about coming backwards. Today, $1,000 in 10 years would be the equivalent of $386 today, given that I could invest it at a 10% compound annual rate. The future amount of money is equivalent to a smaller present amount of money. And here's the math we use for that. This is known as the present value formula. Again, we have the sum of money. And because we're working backwards, we're kind of unwinding the growth that occurred with compounding our investment going forward. So that was multiplication to unwind multiplication, we're going to divide. So notice now we're going to divide by one plus R to the N. The interest rate, or the rate of growth, the number of time periods over which we are compounding. So we can bring a, a sum of money back in time through finding a present value. We can take a sum of money forward in time and watch it grow through future value. If you're into finance at all, those are uh, equations you're going to want to become very familiar with. Fortunately, it's very easy to work with them in Excel. I'll sh bring in some calculations I made in Excel here momentarily to show you some for, um, investment scenarios. And then for our homework, for those of us in Econ 201, I'll have you work through some simple investment scenarios in Excel using future value formulas. 
So we will do the math here momentarily to think about concrete examples of how money can grow over time. But first I want to talk just a little bit about investment options. What can you invest your money in to achieve reliable rates of return over time? Well, there's really only a few things here that are open to most investors. One is securities. Securities are financial instruments that you can attain from any number of financial institutions. The most popular ones are stocks and bonds. There's a few others. Stocks and bonds are going to be the the vast majority of portfolios for most investors. Mutual funds, not a different kind of investment. It's just a different way of investing. So a mutual fund is basically a investment vehicle that can incorporate multiple stocks of multiple different companies, multiple bonds issued by multiple different companies or, or entities, or both. You could have a fund that combined both stocks and bonds. So a, a mutual fund is basically a very convenient way to agglomerate across a wide variety of different stocks or different bonds all at once. Real estate is another option, another popular option for a lot of individual investors. And then you can start a business or you can invest in a family or friends small business directly. A little bit more rare, but there's a lot of people who do run their own businesses and you know rather than taking the savings they earned maybe from their main job and dumping that into the stock market, they might take their savings and dump it into their own business and try to create some uh, income and, and growth opportunities directly. We'll focus here on the stocks and bonds aspect because they're the easiest to project given the historical data on rates of return and with bonds, the fixed and guaranteed nature of the interest payments. So let me talk a little bit more about stocks and bonds. Stocks, of course, are ownership shares of companies. A lot of big companies have billions and billions of shares of stock outstanding. You can buy as little as one share. You can actually buy fractions of shares in most companies. Bonds, on the other hand, are just structured loans that are undertaken by companies or governments. They're highly structured loans with respect to the amount of money that's being borrowed. It's usually in thousand dollar increments. The time frame of the loan, the interest rate of the loan, and so on. With stocks, the value is based entirely on the company's future growth prospects, the future profitability, income of the company. And that value will fluctuate sometimes wildly on a day-to-day -day basis based on any and all news items that may be related to this company's future prospects. Bonds value doesn't really fluctuate a lot in the short run. Value is going to be based on a company's cash flow. So if a company stops generating cash, the value of bonds could go way down because there's a risk that the company might not be able to make the payments on its bonds or pay back the, the principal amount of the bonds at the end of their term. Bonds value will be sensitive to changes in overall interest rates. As overall interest rates go up, the value of existing bonds will go down and vice versa. Stocks can provide income, which is known as dividends company will pay out a portion of its profits to its stockholders that it's not required to. Some stocks are reliable dividend payers. Some stocks pay no dividends. Some companies will occasionally pay dividends when they can. For stocks that don't pay dividends, the source of the investment return is the hope that the value of the company will rise over time and that's reflected in a higher share price over time. Bonds, on the other hand, being loans, do provide a guaranteed income. The company pays interest usually on a semi-annual basis. So if you own a bond issued by a company, you get the interest payment from that bond, from that loan, twice a year, like clockwork, regular guaranteed. If the company misses the interest payment, that's because that company's going broke and that company's in big trouble. And as a bondholder, you, you'll be able to sue them and force them to sell off assets that they own until they generate the cash to pay you. So that makes bonds relatively uh, safer than stocks. Stocks are high risk investments. There's no upside limit to how high a stock price can go. So you could have tremendous returns on a stock. But on the uh, flip side, a value of stock can go to zero. You can lose all your money investing in stocks. And there's uh, many examples of companies 
whose value has fallen to zero. Bonds, as I mentioned, relatively low risk. They're not risk-free, but compared to stocks, they're usually much less risky. Uh, there's zero upside on, on bonds. You get your fixed payments. You get a interest payment that's stated up front in the bond contract. Now, technically speaking, there is some potential for the value of bonds to go up and you can sell your bonds off before they mature. You could possibly earn a premium on the bond, more money than its face value. But if you hold a bond to maturity, you're going to get at best the principal amount, the, the face amount of the loan and your interest payments and no more than that. But consequently, there's also limited downside risk. You're very unlikely to lose your entire capital. Your in investment is unlikely to go to zero with bonds, even if a company defaults, even if the company issuing the bond can't make the interest payments. And the reason why, as I mentioned, is because the, the bondholders who are creditors of the company can force the company to undertake drastic measures to repay the bondholders. So when you hear about a company defaulting on its bonds, Usually investors will lose 5, 10, 20% of their investment. They're not going to lose all of it. It's, it's going to be extremely rare that you would lose more than half of your investment with bonds. Now I want to get into the actual nuts and bolts of uh, thinking about investment growth over time using some of the concepts that we've discussed already. So I'm targeting a million dollars in my portfolio at the end of my investment term. And what I did was I set up a table in Excel and I said, let's start at different ages, 25 through 55. And let's say, how much money would I need to invest each month? Of course, the annual amount here is just this times 12 at a given rate of return. I'm choosing 7% because 7% is the average long run real return, real meaning adjusted for inflation of the S&P 500 stock index, which is basically the 500 largest U.S companies that issue stock, the 500 largest publicly held companies in the U.S. And my figures on this go back to about 1870. It's got a very long track record and a lot of ups and downs over that time period. There have been periods where stocks were down for 10 years. There's also been times where stocks have done extremely well, posting 20, 30, 40, 50 percent returns in a given year. So on average, stocks do grow over time. The value of stocks do, does grow over time. And this is technically speaking the compound annual rate of return. So 7% I think is a pretty uh, solid and pretty conservative expectation based on history for what you might expect to get out of stocks if you hold them for a long time period. If you don't hold stocks for a long time period, there is a lot of volatility and I don't want to get too much into that, but if you're only going to hold stocks for a year, there's a good chance you'll lose money on that. If you're going to hold them for 20 years or longer, Historically speaking, there's minimal to zero chance that you're going to lose money on the investment, and there's a pretty good chance you're going to get the at something close to the 7% projected return. When I'm using future value formulas, I said, what amount would we have to invest? And I'm targeting uh, age 65, so here I have 40 years, okay, 40 years to go, and here it's only 30, and here it's 20, and here it's only 10. Okay, well, if you start at age 25, you only need to put in $417 a month, about 5000 a year, to reach your $1 million by age 65. And that's why I say almost anyone can become rich if you start early enough. Now you might say, Watts, well, I can't put in 400 bucks a month when I'm 25. You know, I'm just getting started. I'm not making a lot of money. Maybe I'm starting a family. Okay, fair enough. Can you put in one or $200 a month? And then you could compensate by when you're 45 years old and you're you know in the prime of your career and making a little more money, you may be put in three or $4,000 a month. So you don't have to do this in an absolutely linear fashion. The point is, if you start earlier, it takes a lot less money to do this. If you wait till you're 35, Notice that this is roughly going to double, okay? If you wait till you're 45, it's gonna uh, be about five times higher amount of money you would need per month, okay, to get to the million dollars. If you wait till you're 55, you, it's almost hopeless. You'd have to put in $72,000 a year at the 7% to, to create a million dollars. You've only got 10 years to work with. So time is on your side if you're young. You can get probably to a million dollars or more if you just start investing sooner and let that compounding work in your favor. I also modeled this by changing the interest rate. I said, let's keep the amount you invest the same at, at the 417 and say, what would need to happen to your interest rate to uh, reach the million dollars by age 65? Well, as you can guess, the 
longer you wait, the more larger return you're going to need. Now, is 11% possible? Yeah, 11% is possible. You're probably not going to sustain that for um, 30 years. 7%, you've got a good chance of averaging that for 30 years. Probably not 11%. 21% is possible in any given year, but again, it's very unlikely that you're going to sustain that for the 20 years you would need here if you started at 45. 62%. Maybe possible if you get lucky with a couple of good stock picks, but uh, impossible to sustain that for multiple time periods. So again, time is on your side if you start young. Anyone can get rich investing if you start early enough and do it consistently. And that's where I'm going to end here. So, uh, five simple rules for investing. This is my personal advice to you. Write this down on an index card, put it in your wallet. This is really, in my opinion, and I'm speaking as a person with uh, graduate degrees in economics and finance, this is really all you need to know. Now, you might want to consult a financial advisor when you get into some kind of specific situations. To reiterate what I was just discussing, start now. Start as soon as you can. Time is on your side. You want to be able to maximize the power of compounding for a longer time period. Number two, diversify. You want to spread your investment across multiple asset types, multiple types of companies. If you're buying mostly stocks, you want to spread your investment across lots of different kinds of companies. The reason why some companies will do well in a recession year for the economy. Most companies will do poorly. So if you have some of your investment in both of those, you'll probably be down in your portfolio, but you'll minimize the amount that you're down. Some companies are going to do well in any given year. You don't know what those companies are. So if you buy stock in 100 companies or 500 or 2000 companies, you're going to have a much better chance of getting some exposure to those companies that do really well. Diversify takes a lot of the risk, the volatility out of your portfolio. So you can limit risk and maintain solid market returns if you diversify. Minimize fees. Fees can be high and they can really erode your investment returns. So there's no reason to pay high fees, especially for a what's known as a managed portfolio, if that managed portfolio can't do any better than what the average market would do, and buying the average market portfolio is going to be a lot cheaper. So you want to find low cost funds. Most investors are going to be very well served by index funds, which are mutual funds that just buy stocks so that they match one of the very popular stock market indices. So you've probably heard of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That's only 30 stocks. And that's a, that's a kind of um, idiosyncratic uh, list of companies. It has some cachet because it's one of the older, uh, oldest stock market indices in the world. But um, most of the uh, investment experts I follow recommend getting into an S&P 500 index fund, which again gets you exposure to the 500 largest publicly traded uh, companies in the U.S. Some uh, index funds that are even uh, larger, there's a Wilshire 5000, so you can get an index fund that represents 5000 companies. That's going to be almost the entire stock market. You can find index funds that specialize in smaller companies. Smaller companies usually have better returns because they, they're more poised to grow faster, but they also have a little bit more volatility. You can get index funds that expose you to dividend paying stocks, value stocks. You can get index funds that expose you to bonds. You might want to talk to a financial advisor to uh, talk about the optimal mix of stocks versus bonds in your portfolio because that is something that you want to alter over time. So I'm not completely against the idea of you having a financial advisor, but uh, in terms of a broad outline of what you need to do, there's there's really not that much to it. You just need to have a disciplined approach and start as soon as you can. You can't beat the market. There's been uh, multiple studies on this, and it shows that people who are trying to pick stocks, pick winners in the stock market, uh, they, they just don't outperform the, the market return consistently over time. They can maybe do it for one or two or three years, but over a five or 10 year period, there's almost no active fund manager who is consistently outperforming the overall market return. And again, that's just the aggregated return. If you were to buy a basket of all stocks of all companies that represented one of those larger stock market indices, 7% real return per year, that's about as good as you can hope for, but that's gonna be plenty. You can get a large amount of wealth built up if you start early enough and save diligently, 7% is going to be plenty for you. And finally, use tax advantages. There are several what are called tax qualified plans within which you can do your investing and saving. 
you're probably familiar with uh, some of these IRAs, individual retirement accounts that you can get as an individual. It's not tied to your employer. You can get that on your own and take it with you wherever you go. And uh, currently you can put about, um, I think $5,500 a year in that. And that comes off of your taxable income. So that um, that is tax advantage. You get tax-free growth and you get a tax deduction when you make that investment. Now, when you would start withdrawing the money and the government makes you do that when you uh, get to around age 70, uh, then you're going to have to pay tax on that. But you'll be in a position to do that because you'll have a lot of money in your um, investments. 401k, of course, is a, a, a company-sponsored um, investment plan for its employees. Roth IRA is basically a traditional IRA with the taxation in reverse. So you pay the tax up front, you don't get a tax deduction on the money you put into that, but you get the tax-free growth. And then when you draw the money out later on as income, it's tax-free. So you can basically choose to front load or back load your taxes. And again, if you get into the position where you're wondering which is best for you, you might want to consult a financial advisor. They can model some different scenarios for you. It kind of depends on your income and um, how much income you want to have in retirement and some other factors. These are pretty simple rules and I hope that you can get excited about investing once you realize the power of compounding and the fact that this is uh, possible. This is, this is something that almost anybody can do even with pretty modest income as long as you commit yourself to setting aside some income, get yourself an IRA, get yourself a, a account where you can have access to mutual funds and just start plugging money into it and give me a call back or send me a postcard in 40 or 50 years and show me how many zeros you have at the end of your financial statements. Let's get rich, shall we? I'll see you next time.